Hello, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Todd, and I'm Industry Relations Manager here at Google UK. Um, has everyone got a drink? Oh, there's, there's a couple down here with a whole bottle of wine that they brought in with them, so fair play to them <laughs> for making the most of this. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today to Google and to our town hall and to welcome you to this Advertising Association, the last one standing event, which I'm sure you'll agree sounds incredibly exciting and good fun. Uh, but before I hand over to our host for this evening, I just wanted to spend a minute talking about the Advertising Association. Google have been a member of the Advertising Association now for about two years, and we're incredibly proud to be associated with them and to do events like this. Um, they're, the, they're a unique industry body because they're the only body that represents the tripartite, part, tripartite of the advertising industry, which is the advertisers, the agencies, and the media owners. And I think that must be incredibly challenging to get any kind of consensus on anything when you've got all three parts of the industry together. But the Advertising Association do it. They're, our, they're an organization that talks to government on behalf of all of us, which is an incredibly powerful tool for us as an industry. But they're more than a mouthpiece. They also challenge us on our moral compass if they think we've got things wrong, which is, which is a brave thing for any industry body to do. And they offer thought leadership, they offer guidance, they offer strategic advice to the industry, which is just fantastic. And, and, and actually, most recently, what I think is the best thing that they've done is, is to actually bring to the forefront the incredible work that the advertising industry does um, to, in, in regard to uh, the UK economy, in regard to the UK society, and in regard to UK culture. It's something that we don't hear enough about publicly. It's something that we don't celebrate enough as an industry, and we should be really proud of that. So, that's a brilliant thing that the Advertising Association has done, and tonight is all about that. It's about celebrating and debating where the advertising industry has most changed the world in its various ways. So it's, it's really good to be here. It's good that you're all here. Um, I'm just going to finish on one thing. Some of you might have heard of a, a guy called Mark Howe. He's, he's kind of a, he's an old hat in the ad industry, and he's, he's the MD of Google's um, agency business in um, Central and Northern Europe. And, and he said recently, and I'm allowed to quote this, so you can't tell me off because he said it publicly, that any business with a vested interest in advertising has a role to play in supporting the Advertising Association's remit, and that joining the AA has been central to Google's development as a mature and committed commercial media owner in the UK. And I think that is, more than anything else, just um, ex exemplifies the, the kind of um, the status that, that the advertising, has, uh, advertising Association has within Google. And if you don't know much about them, take away the stuff that's on your chair tonight, go online, have a look on their website, and look out for future events, because they're a great organization. And I think that's, that's uh, really all I've got to say. So I'm now going to hand over to your host for the evening, Rory Sutherland. Thank you, Thank you so much. Hi. I, I think I'm actually wired up. Um, my name is Rory Sutherland, and I'm probably best known for being a bit of a trade association tart within the industry, um, busily collecting self-aggrandizing job titles. Uh, I was president of the IPA from 2009 to 2011, and I've been closely involved with the advertising uh, association as well. Now, uh, this may actually be, to be honest, complete self-delusion, but I think if I were in most other industries, I'd find trade associations spectacularly dull and silly. I think if I were in, you know, a toaster manufacturer, I'm not sure I get wildly excited uh, going to, um, although come to think of it, I have spoken probably at the toaster manufacturer's uh, 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 trade association annual meeting on, on some occasion that I can't quite remember. But what's quite interesting about um, trade associations in particular in the advertising and marketing field, is the reason they're actually rather interesting and why I actually implore you to get involved from time to time and pay attention to what they do, is they're about the only place where anybody actually talks about how advertising works and what it's for and whether it's a good thing. And that's quite important, because if you think about it, all over London there are tons of agencies of every kind, from PR agencies to advertising agencies to digital agencies to um, direct marketing agencies, all having this debate about what kind of advertising or what kind of um, work a client should do. And perhaps even more damaging still, there are lots and lots of people going around saying to clients, well, we think you could spend a bit less on advertising if you did it like this, our way. And there are lots and lots of people who will go around saying, yes, your advertising is very good, but we think we can make it better. There are ridiculously few people actually going around saying, well, it doesn't really matter what advertising you do, we think you should do more of it. And Jeremy Bullmore made this point long before I ever did, which is that the whole nature of the agency business in particular in our field is all about, no, no, you could be spending even less if it, you know, with the help of our brilliant idea. 
And therefore, there is no, or very, within the agencies themselves, except for the trade associations, there is nobody making the collective case to say, no, this is a good thing. It helps businesses grow. Um, it helps businesses profit from innovation. And it is good for society as a whole. And we think people should do more of it. Now, it's a very, very important uh, message to, to say. And there are a few reasons why both making this case and also arguing and investigating what advertising is for and how it works is so particularly important now. The first problem you face in our business is that over the last 15 to 20 years, effectively neoclassical economic thinking of a fairly basic kind took hold in business schools, took hold in finance departments, took hold also through the medium of the evil Microsoft Excel, which has become kind of the lingua franca of business, that everything is actually uh, communicated through the medium of numbers. Now, the problem is about neoclassical economics, if you think about it. There are lots of problems with it, but the big problem for anybody in advertising and marketing is most of the mathematical assumptions it makes, the assumptions it makes about human behavior and human decision making, in order to achieve a kind of spurious mathematical neatness, they imagine a world where every single business transaction takes place between anonymous actors in a one-off transaction in an atmosphere of perfect information and complete trust. Those are the assumptions that are effectively made in order to make conventional economics, as most people, I think, in finance, most people in business assume them to be. I'm not talking about the most advanced economists here. I'm talking about someone who went to business school and did a year of economics. That's effectively what they think. Now, there are a couple of problems with this. Um, the whole point about perfect information, perfect trust, individual anonymous actors. Uh, one fairly significant problem with this is that this exists in the real world somewhere between rarely and never. Um, just, to, just to give you an idea of how weird that world would be, there would be no need for taxis in that world. You just say, oh, that bloke over there, he's heading back, back in my direction. Uh, since he trusts me completely, I'll just hop in his cab and offer, or hop in his car, give him a pound, and he'll take me home. Okay? I mean, the, you know, a world where that actually existed. I mean, maybe it does exist among the Amish periodically. Although they actually had an Amish serial killer recently, didn't they? Which puts a kind of kibosh on that theory. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but, but the other thing, the first point about this is it's an entirely imaginary world uh, detailing the behavior of a species that doesn't exist. The second problem about it, which is a problem for us, is that in this imaginary world, of course, of perfect information and perfect trust, there is no need for marketing or advertising at all. And so if you understand why the marketing field and the advertising field has a problem justifying itself to boards, typically now the CEO you'll find has a background in finance, it's because deep in his head is some idea of a perfect world where you don't need any marketing and advertising because to obtain perfect inf efficiency, uh, you can simply assume perfect information and complete trust. So neoclassical economics is hostile to quite a lot of things. It's massively hostile, I, I would argue, uh, in its adoption in, by the financial sector uh, to all areas of human well-being uh, through its incredibly dangerous assumptions that it makes. But it's particularly dangerous to us because it creates a generation of people who fantasize about a world where you don't need marketing, you don't need advertising at all. Now, if you're a game theorist, by contrast, if you look at the world through the eyes of game theory rather than through the eyes of economics, actually something quite interesting emerges, which is that, broadly speaking, people who advertise are more trustworthy than people who don't. It's not an infallible rule, by the way. But if you think about it, someone who advertises is engaging in a costly activity which only pays off over time. Therefore, it's a fairly reliable form of proof that they're planning to be in business and to do business repeatedly with lots of people over time, which is a fairly good indicator of trust, by the way. Our long-term intentions for our business and the extent to which we're willing to make upfront investments which only pay back over the long time that's a pretty good indicator that you're dealing with somebody you can actually trust. A game theorist would say, effectively, advertising is a pre-commitment device, um, rather like an engagement ring, in fact, which is also upfront investment as proof of long-term commitment. Sorry to ruin the romantic notions you may have of engagement rings there. 
But broadly speaking, that's how engagement rings work. You spend a large amount of money up front. That suggests that you'll only get payback for this investment if the relationship lasts a reasonably long time. There are cheaper ways of getting a one-night stand than going out and handing out $5,000 diamond rings, if you think about it. I don't know what they are, but people do tell me. Um, <laughs> so this is very, very important. The second reason it's very, very important that we, we counter this nonsensical stuff um, is simply because we now need to know how advertising works. What I've posited, the game theoretic pre-commitment device theory, which I think is only one explanation of how some advertising works, um, is only part of it. But the reason we need to know how advertising works now is there are so many more different kinds of it. A pretty simple assumption that actually the only metrics that mattered were effectively frequency and reach. Broadly speaking, the assumption was the more people you reached, the better. It didn't really matter when you reached them because we were assumed to have consistent preferences. And in any case, we were always talking to people at one remove from the point of decision or the point of sale. Those, by the way, the incredibly simplistic model of advertising that existed for about 40 years was perfectly serviceable for about 30 years. If you could only use mass media, if you were selling products that were sold through one channel only, for example, and there was, a, you know, there was only one fairly straightforward path to buying something, then actually, rather like those crappy maps you draw when you help a friend find your house, you know, when you draw a line and go high street, pub, phone box, my house, okay? <laughs> That's a model which is perfectly fit for purpose, you know, you don't need to have the full Google satellite image of your locality. That's what you need in order to navigate that world. What we now have is a world that's much, much more complicated than that, and the old model just doesn't apply. So asking the question, how does advertising work? Are there different ways in which it works? What is there about evolved human psychology that actually makes people instinctively trust people with a, a reputation that's been bought at cost over time? Understanding those things didn't really give you any advantage 20 years ago, but it does now. So the kind of inquiry that trade organizations like the IPA and the Advertising Association engage in, in asking the big questions, you might argue those were a philosophical indulgence 25 years ago, because even if you had some fantastic insight into how people chose or decided, you didn't have the media ecosystem to enable you to react to that new insight because you were basically left with how many people do we talk to and how often. That was, you know, there was no point in building a model more sophisticated than the one necessary for executing what you could do. Now it's fundamentally different. We need to understand that actually you don't just have target markets, you have target moments. And that there are, you know, that actually people's preferences are not consistent. They're hugely affected by context and moment and framing and other stuff like this. So these big questions are really, really worth asking now. But it's also a worthwhile time, as I mentioned, because of the natural hostility we tend to get from finance, we will not win that battle simply by proving that advertising works. We need to have a good explanation of how, and how it changes the world, and how it improves things, not just how it makes a difference for a short term to one brand once or twice. Unless we can answer the bigger picture question, we won't actually win it. Otherwise, we're simply on the defensive, effectively producing lots and lots of econometrics which go, it's not that crap honest. Okay? That's effectively a defensive mode of argument, saying, look, we didn't waste your money, promise. Okay? Actually, by explaining how it works, that's how you fundamentally win the argument. And that's how you make the people content to spend money, finally, on something they can properly understand. And so we have now five people who I think will give case studies for 10 minutes each, explaining exactly that. We'll start with David Adamson from Fallon. I won't give away what they're talking about. I think it's best to leave it as a surprise, and one or two of them will surprise you a great deal. Uh, Mary Burris from Google, Elspeth Fisher from Starcom, Joanna Geary from The Guardian, and um, Imad Nadim from Kenko and hence Mondelez uh, International. Um, they have a very strict timing limit, so strict, in fact, that if you look at the clock that's behind you, you see it actually goes down to a thousandth of a second, which I think is probably <laughs> probably a degree of accuracy and precision that we won't need on this, on this evening. Uh, but we'll, we'll do our best. So I'll, I'll leave you with that entirely and just hand over to David as the first speaker for his 10 minutes. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic.
Hello, everybody. Wow, there are an awful lot of you. Uh, thanks for that, Rory. Um, so I signed up for this thinking, this will be a breeze. Advertising has totally changed the world. This is going to be easy. Not so much. See, the problem is, the more you think about it, the bigger the question becomes. For a start, what is advertising anymore anyway? It's a catch-all phrase we use to describe a whole range of things from campaigns to content creation, social media activity, developing platforms, new media innovations. It's a, God's, it's a, it's a curse of a definition because it can mean everything and nothing, though a godsend when you have to explain to your grandmother what you actually do for a living. <laughs> so when thinking about this idea of advertising that's changed the world, I struggled because whilst there's a lot of stuff out there that's really cool, and it's completely changed my world, and it's completely changed all of your worlds as well and the way the advertising world works. How much of this stuff can genuinely say it's made enough of an impact to change the real world? As one of five young people brought here today to stand up and give an opinion, it didn't feel genuine to stand up here and recite a case study like a history project. So when I was thinking about all of this, a friend said something to me that really made me think. She said, the best things are the things that become invisible. The stuff that vanishes into the way we live our lives every day because it's so easy and it's so small that you just don't notice. And so I stopped worrying about the big things and I started thinking about the small things instead. The stuff that advertising has done to encourage people to take on small actions or do small things and then collectively combine these to have a much bigger impact. The TAP project is a great example of this, an initiative for UNICEF where for just one day, people were asked to pay $1 for the glass of tap water that they drank when they ate out in cafes and restaurants. Collectively, all of these funds were then pulled together to help fund UNICEF's clean water projects around the world. When this was launched in New York, hundreds of cafes and bars and restaurants took part. And in a single day, enough money was raised to provide 4 million children with clean drinking water. Since then, the TAP project has expanded into different cities around the world and remains an annual event that collectively raises millions to prevent children dying from, from water contamination and from thirst. It worked, but it worked because it captured a whole load of people who wouldn't normally donate to a cause, not by bigging up a message of worthiness, but by making their required involvement seem so tiny and so simple and so easy. They were just asked to take one small action. Although UNICEF's big ambition of providing 990 million people with access to clean water is pretty world-changing stuff, that's not the specific reason I'm talking about it. The thing that interests me about it is the mechanic that sits at the heart of it. It's one of the most sex successful demonstrations of how, collectively, a whole, load of things, a whole load of small things, in this case micro donations, can come together to create a much larger impact on the world. If you apply this approach to the way people live their lives and the tools they use every day, you've got the potential to make some really big impacts. And although the example I've used to demonstrate this is a charitable one, it extends beyond charity. For example, developing new products. A few months ago, the world's first smartwatch was launched through Kickstarter online. It beat both Apple and Samsung to first place in the market and collectively raised $10 million uh, collectively raised $10 million, all funded through 85,000 small donations online. Barack Obama's campaign in 2008 raised a staggering $410 million. Uh, that's $150 million more than any other presidential campaign. 30% of that was funded through small donations, and a huge amount of that was leveraged through social media. So what about if you apply this mechanic to the content that we enjoy online every day? Sent Up is an American organization that lets people contribute in minute amounts to the illustrators, bloggers, designers, writers, and musicians that create the content that we enjoy online. All you do is hit a tiny button at the bottom of a post. And what about if you think about the way people everyday, people's everyday routines? So doing your weekly shop. Pennies, an organization in the UK, lets people round up their card payments by just a few pence. When this piloted a few years ago, in just a few, when this piloted the other year, in just a few high street shops, in just a few days, collectively, collectively it raised 18,000 pounds for, uh, for British charities and community projects. Think about it this way for a minute. If 
everybody, if, half, if just half of the cardholders in the UK rounded up their card payments by just a few pennies a week, say 8p a week, collectively we'd raise an extra £90 million a year for UK charities. Or what about when you bring mobile into the mix? Although this is still early days, it opens up a whole load of opportunities for people contributing spontaneously and emotionally as they react to experiences they have in the world around them, all by reaching into a device that's sitting in their pocket. This is something that Google are currently exploring with One Today, an app that lets people make minute contributions to research or to projects or to charities that really hit home with them and that they're passionate about all through their mobile phone. But why do you have to stop there? Why are we just talking about money? I mean, our industry has historically been very good at getting people to spontaneously part with their cash, but why can't we get people to spontaneously part with other things in small amounts, such as their skills? GIFGAF, the mobile phone network, is a brand built entirely on the model that by harnessing the collective power of a lot of people doing a lot of small things, they can make a big difference for the, how their organization is run. Members contribute their time and their skills in small amounts to different parts of the organization, such as sales or customer support, marketing, product innovation, to collectively make the whole network run better. I see this as all an interesting challenge for the evolving advertising industry to continue developing ways of harnessing en masse one of the greatest untapped resources on the planet, the power of people's good intentions. By developing ways to do this that are easy and collective, it removes many of the barriers people put up for themselves, such as, I'd help, but I don't have enough time, or money, or it's just too much effort. To me, this is advertising evolving to provide easy ways for people to take actions and contribute towards things, even if it's just in a small way. So an advertising idea, campaign, or innovation that's changed the world. Back to my original question, can advertising change the world at all? That's debatable and the reason that we're all here, but I'd say people can change the world. And advertising's role has, in whatever guise, always been to spread the message and prompt people to act. Whereas now, we can offer people small ways to contribute immediately that when channeled collectively can help bring about huge changes in the world. And we can do this in a way that has the potential to become as culturally ingrained and as habitual as tipping at the end of a meal or asking for a glass of free tap water. Thank you very much. Hello. I feel kind of like I'm on a reality TV show, but <laughs> with your, yeah, X Factor or something. Um, anyway. I'm Mary Burris, and I'm going to talk to you about how I think advertising has changed the world, and specifically how I think digital advertising has changed the world and empowered small business owners and democratized the industry. And I'm going to tell you about this with just a simple story, one small business owner's simple story and how I think she epitomizes this overall change. This is Julie Dean, and this is her with her children. She was a stay-at-home mom, and she did the occasional speaking slot at Cambridge University. She earned 600 pounds at one of these speaking slots, and she used this money to start her business. And the reason why she started her business was because of her children. Her daughter was being bullied at school, and she wanted to raise enough money using her business to put forward two sets of school fees so that she could move to her daughter to a new school. So she came up with this idea. She narrowed down a list of businesses that she wanted to do, and she decided on satchels because she'd struggled to find anywhere that sold these satchels like she'd had when she was younger, and she wanted to give her daughter one. And she decided to do the satchels, and she decided to search online, see if anyone else had had this idea. She found one school in the UK that was still selling satchels to their students. She emailed them. She found out tirelessly who their supplier was. She's a very motivated individual. She contacted the supplier, got six satchels delivered with the 600 pounds that she had to spend, no more on starting this business. And then she realized she had to sell them. 
So she searched online to learn more about UK fashion bloggers. She researched them, she emailed them, and unlike most startups, she couldn't send them actual samples of her product. She had to send them pictures that she'd taken around Cambridge of her satchels. Because she needed to sell those six samples, she needed to make money to achieve her goal. And she did. She sold the six satchels, she doubled her, or her order with her suppliers, and she now has a company of 70 people, she has her own factory, and she was last year's businesswoman of the year. Now Julie would agree, without the web and without digital, none of this would have been possible. So Julie now has a more sophisticated, more varied digital strategy. She uses Facebook, she uses Twitter, she uses YouTube, and she uses Google to reach her customers. But now she has a turnover of $10 million a year. 10 million pounds a year, I'm American, yes. 10 million pounds a year. And she's proved that you can have 600 pounds to start up a company and turn it into a multi-million dollar business. This is what digital has allowed for us to do. Digital has leveled the playing field, so now small and large businesses can play on the same playground. Digital has allowed you to be able to, unlike traditional advertising, which had prohibitive startup costs with creative and media, with digital, you can pay as you go, you can invest as much or as little as you need to to start off, start small like Julie did, and you can even create your own creative if you want to. I found Julie's story extremely inspiring. I think it represents how digital advertising has democratized the industry. It's allowed small business owners to reach their consumers, to be able to measure their success through their website, and to be able to tailor their advertising strategy so that they can reach those true fanboys first and then build success from there. I think her story epitomizes this, and I wanted to finish by playing it from her perspective and how digital played such a key role in her business and how it's changed the world. <laughs> cool. Um, hi, I'm Elspeth. <laughs> And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about cool. the fact that there is a bit of a war going on. And for me, this war is between the content that consumers love and can't get enough of and the advertising messages that they seem so desperate to avoid at all costs. And really, content has the advantage in this war because it ultimately sits at the heart of consumers' lives and because they can control of it, you know, especially in this on-demand world. They can have the content that they want, whenever they want, on any device they want. You know, they can watch a video of ping pong at midnight, if that's what they are after. Um, and even though advertising in, in all its forms, as, uh, as, as grey as that whole area might be, sits at the heart of their decision making, um, content is king and advertising is like the enemy. Which has led, I think, to a really interesting dynamic in the advertising space because it's created this battle, which means that branded content is seen as, as the sort of antidote to advertising. It's like the holy grail. If I hear another client say, I just want to get, want to get consumers to watch my content, read my content, share my content. By the way, it's not usually very good content. Um, it's like... Advertiser-funded programming is the pinnacle of brand expression. Um, you know, uh, product placement is like the ultimate and covert integration. And all us evil advertisers sit in our bunker thinking, oh, we've really pulled the wool over their eyes with that one. You know, we've really gone under the radar with that message. That'll, that'll really get them. You know, cue evil agency laugh fueled by too many late nights and probably one too many liquid lunches. I'm not going to do the laugh. It wouldn't come off. It wouldn't come off. And while this battleground to us um, might seem quite clear, because we understand the rules, what we can and can't say, 
To a consumer, the line is pretty blurred. But for me, this doesn't even really go far enough because for consumers, this line, this line between content and advertising, it isn't just blurred, it's, it's barely there at all. And this is something that I want to explore with you guys in what um, I would say is quite a risky strategy, so please bear with me. Um, I've collated some examples um, of content and of advertising and of everything in between. Um, and we're going to play the game, <laughs> part of the show, or oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I told you it was a risky strategy. But hold on a second. Um, I'm not asking you the question, because what I'm interested in is how consumers feel about it. So I have a highly scientific method um, of gauging consumer opinion, and the scientific method is entitled. What does my mum think? <laughs> OK, so we're going to play a game of heads and tails. I'm sorry, everyone needs to stand up. There is a prize in everything, so bear with me, bear with me. So we're going to have an example. We're going to ask the question. Part of the show, and that's your heads, or no, 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 and that's your tails, OK? And if you get it wrong, you have to sit down. OK, dance, pony, dance. What does my mum think? Part of the show? No, no, no. Vote now. OK, part of the show? Or no, no, no. OK? Well, my mum thinks this is part of the show. She loves that pony. So if you're a tail, sit down. OK, second up. Smeg fridges in the Great British Bake Off. Part of the show? Well, no, no, no. No, no, no. That's, that was so obvious. She assumed it must have been paid for. She was like, well, surely, something's going on here, something's going on here. And remember, consumers don't distinguish between commercial and non-commercial channels. That is just something that we think about. It's just something that we think about. OK, cool. And um, Bonds Watch. Part of the show? No, no, no. You guys voting? OK, that's just part of the show. But I think that's just because Bond has been whoring himself out so long. She is used to that. She is just used to it. OK, uh, last year's X Factor, the Corinthia Hotel. Part of the show? No, no, no. Yeah, it's no, no, no. You guys got that one. Cool. Apple in Sex in the City. You guys voting? Yeah, that's just part of the show. She didn't spot that. She didn't spot that. OK. Coke and Pepsi. It's OK, we're narrowing the field now. We're narrowing the field. Um, Coke and then more recently Pepsi and American Idol. No, no, no. Cool. I think we're nearly there. The John Lewis Snowman. Part of the show? Got a vote. Oh, she thinks that's part of the show. She loves those snowmen. Oh, why can't she? OK, I, I, there's only one prize. <laughs> I'm going to go with you in the middle. Sorry. <laughs> OK, cool. Game's over, game's over. So how did this happen? How did we get ourselves into this pickle? Um, well, for me, it was an advertising idea that really shifted things. Um, although, again, we're, we're in a slightly blurry area. Maybe it started in 1933 with Mar Perkins, which was a radio serial sponsored by P&G's Oxtel Soap Powder. And from there, they went on to launch The Guiding Light, which really paved the way for a ton of, 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 of content like this. Um, I mean, that's why they're called soap operas, for those of you that don't know. That's where we get the term from. Arguably, and just really briefly to step away from, from the screen, because I'm conscious that I've been talking about, you know, more about sort of the TV arena, you could even trace it back to 1902 with um, a comic strip called Buster Brown, which ran in the New York Herald. This slightly scary looking chap. Um, and that was used to promote um, Brown's shoe company shoes, but it was one of the first examples of essentially content that was put there by an advertiser, but that consumers probably didn't realize. Um, for the buffs in the room, there probably are even earlier examples. A lot of them are pretty racist. So I didn't want to put them on the screen. But hey, dig into that into your, in your uh, spare time if that's what you're after. So essentially what we're talking about is advertisers coming on board as executive producers 
and for me, forever blurring the line between advertising and content. Because they owned the show, they owned the talent, and they owned the story. Um, and this really started this kind of avalanche of everybody wanting a piece of that content pie. Um, and since that time, broadcasters kind of bounced around in this matrix. Commercial breaks, sponsorships, product placement. You know, ITV took it too far in the 60s with their ad mags, massive wrist slapping. And broadcasters, a lot of them still haven't quite figured out where on the continuum they want to sit and where they're comfortable. But that actually puts us in a really exciting position because even though branded content is being punted as like the next best thing and the latest, the latest thing, it feels very new. Actually, we've been there and done it with, you know, with a lot of things. And we can learn from that. And we as advertisers can take advantage because that's what we do, right? We can take advantage of that blurred line and work on really perfecting that mix of advertising and content um, for everybody. The two things can learn from each other, they can inform each other, they can complement one another. Um, we just need to learn from the past um, and remember where it all started. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name's Joanna Geary, and um, I'm completely unqualified to be here tonight. <laughs> Everyone keeps saying that this is like X Factor. If it is, I'm Rylan Clark, just with uh, fewer backing singers, yellower teeth. Um, but I'm going to focus on Rylan. I'm going to channel Rylan, and I'm going to try and do this with enthusiasm, <laughs> even if the knowledge might not be there. Um, the reason the knowledge isn't there is because um, I don't really know anything about advertising. I've never worked in advertising. Um, I'm an editorial person. I started off as a reporter at the glorious Birmingham Post newspaper um, and um, worked my way up, ended up in the Times, um, focused on social media, and I'm now social and communities editor for The Guardian, which is like a dream, uh, except I'm leaving, which sounds a bit bad, but it's a great job. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm actually joining Twitter in November, but um, because of the social media aspect of it, <laughs> this has all gone wrong. <laughs> anyway, to the presentation. Um, so, uh, I'm not really qualified to talk about advertising. I don't understand this world. And this is my ASCII keyboard representation of what I did when a very nice person called me up and asked me to do this. Uh, Translated into uh, another meme. I don't know. I have no idea. How does advertising change the world? I mean, changing the world, right? Uh, the advertising campaign or invitation that has most changed the world. I put it, I got a bit George Lucas on it because I felt it was pretty epic. This changed the world. The end of the Cretaceous period. Great big bloody meteorite fell on Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. Now, I'm sure advertising could have added a little bit of panache to this, but I'm not sure it could have stopped the meteorites. This is changing the world. So I thought, oh, I can't really answer this question. I'm going to have to narrow it down. So uh, 66 million years is a lot of time to choose from. So how about we just go for 200,000 years? This is uh, Mr. or Ms. Mr. Homo sapien. Um, and this is the... Uh, first time that uh, Homo sapiens existed and came out of Africa and the human race was created. So let's talk about changing humankind and human history. Now, I could choose something that I think changed human history. That's easy. The invention of the printing press. Of course I'm going to say that, but it did. It changed literacy rates. It, changed, it created the Reformation. It changed the way that people thought about politics and the ruling classes and religion and so on and so forth. That's changing human history, right? So it was quite humbling when I was sitting there thinking, well, what does advertising do? You know, sorry, newspaper person, editorial. And then I realized, oh, actually, I kind of know what it did. Um, it did this in 1624. This is uh, Mr. Butter's weekly news book. And at the end of the weekly news book, he uh, decided 
to add that in the last printed news of September the 11th, I told you that there could be no perfect description of the siege of Breda, since this has come over a perfect description of the same. The substance whereof is formally set down in this relation. I do propose likewise to cut the map, wherein you may with the eye behold the siege in a manner as lively as if you were an eye witness. You may not expect this map within six days. <laughs> now, I grant you, we're probably going to be a bit snappier if we were going to do this now, but this, many historians believe, is the first example of a newspaper effort. Granted, uh, Nathaniel actually owned the publication, so it's, uh, it's kind of iffy whether it actually was, but um, it was the first time that anything was seen within a news publication that actually was about selling a product. And it seemed like a good thing. In fact, not very long after, in historical terms, uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson wrote this wonderful piece in The Idler that says, genius is shown only by invention. The man who first took advantage of the general curiosity that was excited by a siege or battle to betray the reader of news into the knowledge of the shop where the best puffs and powders were to be sold was undoubtedly a man of great sagacity and profound skill in the nature of man. <laughs> Couldn't have put it better myself, Dr. Johnson. <laughs> I may come back to you at some point. And he's absolutely right. It really was a moment that changed human history. But some people might not think so. I know we haven't exactly put ourselves in a wealth of glory over the years, and um, many people are going to think about things like the news of the world, phone hacking, and the campaign to age, end page three when we talk <laughs> about newspapers, newspaper advertising, funding things. But let me convince you. Let's start in 1855. Does anyone know the handsomely bearded chap on the right? No? This chap is William Howard Russell. And he worked for the Times and reported from the Crimean War. And the result of his reports was that the British public were horrified by the state in which British troops were being looked after and cared for when they were injured, which convinced the lady on the left Florence Nightingale, to get involved and to develop modern day nursing methods. As well, a number of engineers decided, in order to help the war effort, to build the Grand Crimean Central Railway. That's a fairly impactful event. Um, now, what has this got to do with advertising? Well, by this point, 1855, we had already seen the birth of the advertisement a couple of hundred years before. And actually, in 1833 in New York, the New York Sun was born, which was considered to be the first ever mass market newspaper. Um, and not quite so encumbered by taxes as the British, surprise, surprise, um, 50 to 75% of newspaper space was taken up by adverts in America. This was a massive thing. And it was a massive thing because it proved that advertising could support amazing journalism. And you may say to me, well, hmm, that's the New York Sun, this is the Times. You know, this had all the sort of funding that you might ever want um, from proprietors. Well, hmm. when the uh, Universal Daily Register was published, which eventually became the Times, um, the owner did actually quote, a newspaper resembles an inn where the proprietor is obliged to give the use of his house to all travellers who are ready to pay and against whose persons there are no particular legal or moral objection to. <laughs> that was the time. So they knew the power and the usefulness of advertising. I'm going to have to go quickly. This is Guernica. Um, Guernica was reported by another Times journalist, George Steer. Um, he, was a, he was the first one in and was able to prove that um, German neutrality was a sham and that the Germans were involved in the bombing of the Basque country. This story was syndicated across the world, one of the biggest ones, and seen as very much the beginning of war reporting, um, and went to the New York Times and changed government attitudes towards Germany. By this point, advertising is big business. In 1914, there was £10 million spent on advertising in the UK, which is more than we actually spent on defence at that time, <laughs> on the First World War. So hopefully, I'll try to find the figures, couldn't find them, suspect we spent a little bit more on World War II. <laughs> However, um, what's really interesting is that the prominence of adverts to make this happen still meant that George's, George Steer's story, the foundation of war reporting, appeared on page 17 of the Times. 
because the first page and the number of pages afterwards were dedicated to adverts. And adverts didn't disappear off the front pages until 1966 for the Times. And I should also remember that, you know, it's not just the broadsheets. The news of the world, much maligned these days, but it had its moments of glory. This is 1986 when uh, they ran the story that uh, Jeffrey Archer had been uh, having relations with a prostitute and attempted to pay her off. Um, their story was completely right. The star story was completely right. They, uh, Jeffrey Archer sued the star, but um, that led to, of course, being proved that he had perjured himself in 2001 and why he ended up in prison. I stuck an extra big momentous thing because, of course, the printing press was important, but so was the internet. And we continue, oh God, one minute, go on. Internet, the internet age in a minute. Here's the Guardian website, <laughs> 1996. Here's Ian, Ian Tomlinson, the moment that we discovered that there was a really strong power to using social media in order to find a video that proved that he had been knocked over by policemen during the G8 riots in 2009, the Guardian story. Also 2009, MP's expenses. Telegraph's incredible scoop. Again, the power of the internet when um, the Guardian released the uh, files and allowed people to actually start looking for their own MPs and the sorts of expenses that they had spent money on, like duck houses. <laughs> and 2013, right up to the present day, the NSA story challenges everything to do with governments, to do with um, freedom of expression, privacy, the um, internet, um, our freedoms, everything still very much supported by newspaper advertising, sort of. <laughs> yes, it's true. You have, advertising has helped us change the world, change human history. Um, as we've gone online, that has not been as easy. Um, we used to make 70 to 90% of revenue through print adverts. Nowadays, according to the US, um, total revenue streams from print uh, newspaper adverts are around 46%. But... Yeah, advertising rates are growing online, newspaper digital ad sales, mm, not so much. <laughs> Let's go back to um, Dr. Johnson while I'm <laughs> running over. Uh, <laughs> whatever is common is despised. Advertisements are now so numerous that they are negligently perused and it's therefore become necessary to gain attention by magnificence of promises and by eloquence, sometimes sublime and sometimes prophetic. Yes, <laughs> that is what's happened. <laughs> and so, Back to Johnson. Genius is shown only by invention. And that is where I'm going to have to rush through because I'm playing for time. But Guardian Witness is our attempt at that and is where I believe we can continue to have that partnership where we help change human history. This is an application that we launched in April. It's allowing people to tell their stories to us by mobile phones, but it's fully integrated to our CMS and the way that we run our website. We have been able to get incredible stories that show us incredible images from very big events such as Woolwich. We can tell small stories like how no one turned up to watch Margaret Thatcher's funeral in the square in Edinburgh. That was shared 7,000 times in a few hours on Facebook. If, you don't, if that's people telling their stories for us. Um, and we believe it's true. We're going to overhaul our brand partnerships business to meet more advertiser demand for specific digital campaigns, says the drum, which is good because I didn't know, but it's called Guardian Labs and I knew that. Um, and it's about us doing things differently. And it's about us continuing that fantastic moment from 1624 where advertising changed the world and helped us record and bring people information that made a difference to their worlds. So what's next? Thank you. Right, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Imad. Uh, I work for Mondelez. That's how it's pronounced. It's not Mondelez, it's not Mondelez. Um, I am following these four incredible people, um, and I am the token client in the room. Uh, so, you know, some of my thinking may not be as sophisticated as some of the guys <laughs> that you've seen before me. Uh, but, I mean, you know, you guys have sensed a bit of a theme here, advertising that changes the world, um, and, you know, big ideas change the world. Um, and I'm going to make an argument, which everyone is potentially going to agree with, which is that big ad, ad, uh, big ad ideas uh, can actually change the world. Um, and the reason for that, uh, and, and therefore, us as advertisers, uh, broadly speaking, need to really handle them with care. Uh, because when we do our job really, really well, we have the ability to really alter, um, we have the real power to alter the fabric of society. Um, and you know, that sounds pretty damn grand. Uh, 
Um, and it is, which is awesome, uh, because we're in the business of storytelling. Uh, and good stories are how societies pass on uh, their values, their beliefs, and they transcend generations. Um, and ultimately, uh, storytelling is how we evolve. Uh, which, is, which, is, which is great, which means that the greatest ever story or the greatest ever uh, ad campaign is, uh, is religion. Um, and actually Christianity, therefore, is a solid ad campaign. Uh, now, you might disagree, uh, but you know, so have you. The good news is I know very little about Christianity. It's really late, it's raining outside, so we're not gonna talk about Christianity. Um, what we're gonna talk about is something a bit more modern, so back to the future once again. Um, something not 2,000 years ago, but more like 1950s. And I don't think many people here are old enough to have born, uh, who have uh, been around in the 1950s. Uh, so I'm going to take us back to that fabulous era. It was all about freedom. The war had ended, and we were in a state of massive euphoria. We were fabulous, we were stylish, we were liberated, we were fashionable. Uh, we were appreciating art once again. Uh, music was going through a massive revolution. We were glamorous, we had fancy frocks, and we had some sweet rides. <laughs> Nothing like this over here. Um, the moon, well, we hadn't really gotten to it, but we were all about getting it on under it, which was great. Um, back in the day, you could untag yourself on um, pictures, but there was a slightly different way of doing it. Um, and, and the other thing that was happening during that time was uh, that women, uh, filtered cigarettes were for women. Uh, they were for gorgeous, absolutely phenomenal, glamorous women. And then came along Marlboro Man. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, because I think, you know, being a bit more mainstream about this and talking about an ad campaign, I think it was one of the most genius ad campaigns that ever ran, um, and that it truly did have a remarkable impact on the world. And you could argue whether it was positive or not, but I think I know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> let's, let's, let, let's think back at the context. In the 50s, um, cigarettes, Marlboro specifically, uh, filtered cigarettes were all about sort of advertising to women. It was all about the mildness, smoothness. Uh, filtered tips were supposed to be good for your lips, which was nice. Um, and uh, you know that, that's the brand that Marlboro was. At that time, for the first time in history, people have started to realize that actually cigarettes are dangerous for you. They're not good for your health, uh, and they're addictive. And doctors were starting to talk about how um, they, were, they were genuinely uh, going to kill you. Um, and, um, and so the industry decided, we've got filtered cigarettes, which is great. We're going to start talking about them. We're going to turn those same doctors into spokespeople for us. Uh, we're going to talk about how it's good for you, it's mild, it's much better. Uh, you know, scientists and educators smoke Kent, good for them. Uh, and this is my favorite one. More doctors smoke Camel than any other cigarette. <laughs> okay, good for them. Um, and Marlboro at that time, and it's hard to believe today, but they were real small fish. They had 1% share of the market at that time. Um, and it was, it was a really, really niche brand. Uh, and these were the big boys at that time, Camel. And, you know, Marlboro was trying to be the challenger brand at that time. Uh, and they realized that this whole sort of fad around cigarettes was actually a real big opportunity for them. Uh, so they spoke to this guy, he's Leo Burnett, um, and um, he was a true visionary. And what he realized was that there was a problem with the product in that it was inherently dangerous for you, uh, and it was inherently de um, destructive for your health. Uh, but actually, it was also uh, a huge image statement, and you know, there was something in here uh, that we could work with. Um, you know, they were genuinely addictive and really bad for your health. Um, and therefore, when you talked about sort of them being good for your health, you were actually focusing people on the fact that you should be fearful about what the product could do to you um, and how addictive you could be about it. And so he came back with an idea which was more of an image, not a health statement about filtered cigarettes, but an image of uh, a man that was the entire, that was a complete antithesis of um, an, addicted, an addictive killer. Uh, it was a man that was, that was free, he was a man that was indestructible, um, and that's what the Marlboro Man was. So in his early years, he did um, a whole, the Marlboro Man had a whole lot of manly professions like carpenter and sailor, 
um, which was great. But then they came up with the cowboy. And, and you know what? It had fantastic results. Uh, the ad was on. And uh, within two years at that time, uh, Marlboro um, increased their sales by 300%. So they went from being a $5 billion brand to becoming a $20 billion brand. Uh, I'd love to be the brand manager <laughs> doing that. Uh, but clearly, I was not. Um, and um, they were, at the, at the same time, they realized they wanted to be really authentic. They started to have real cowboys that they started to cast, uh, which was good because the average American couldn't really ride on horses, which was quite tricky for them with these ads. Uh, and by sort of the end of, uh, within a decade, they became um, absolute market leaders from having had 1% share of the market, which was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and the whole idea was that it created this sort of entity, which was the filtered cigarette, which became an accessory uh, which every man saw himself having an image uh, that was associated with the Marlboro Man on. And why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to be the tough guy? You know, why wouldn't you want to be this cool guy, uh, you know, battling horses, animals, and conquering land? Um, and he was all of those things. Um, and he was his own boss, which was a fantastically romantic notion. Uh, he didn't need any government. He didn't need any uh, rules. Uh, all he needed was his Marlboro. Uh, and that was powerful. So Marlboro became this sort of thing that would give access to this club of free men um, that saw him as the representative uh, of their group, which was great. Um, the other thing that started to happen was that, um, I mean, I've just got a whole lot of images of this guy because <laughs> he's, he, he is fabulous. Um, <laughs> Just so you know, three of the original Marlboro men did die of cancer, lung cancer, <laughs> so do not be tempted. Um, but anyway, so what, what it did was cigarettes became cool. They were in culture. Uh, you know, it, it was just always really cool to be uh, with your cigarette. Uh, but at the same time, it was, some, it was a product that was inherently social. Uh, and it was a little bit rebellious still to smoke, although they were a bit cool. Uh, and that meant that um, there was a new recruitment strategy that could be employed, and the Marlboro men could actually not just sh st steal share, but actually grow the category, uh, technical term, um, in order to, uh, and, and this was the way that they recruited people. And for 45 years, the Marlboro man recruited people by being aspir aspirational to young people, um, which is a bit dark. Uh, but what, you know, pretty bright for Marlboro, though, because uh, by the end of it all, <laughs> as of today, uh, they're at least three times as big as their next competitor, uh, which is great. Uh, now, the Marlboro man is not a new sort of idea, because, you know, I think, David, you talked about um, Coke and Santa and how you know he's a personality or property that's been created uh, by a brand and Ronald McDonald has had a fun run as well. Uh, but actually, the good thing about uh, the different thing or the thing that made it really effective was that people didn't really want to be Santa or Ronald McDonald, uh, <laughs> but they wanted to be this guy, uh, and that was really really powerful. And actually, it was so powerful that for the first time, people started to realize that. Advertising in and of itself can take an existing product and change your relationship with it fundamentally. Um, and it was so powerful uh, that we had to have regulation for it. Because actually, it had had such a big societal impact and it had become such a big problem just on the back of advertising being so effective that we need to do something about it. TV ads started to get banned for the first time um, and you know because they were so good. Uh, the kind of stuff that you saw. And, and that was the kind of thing that we needed to, uh, that really sort of started to make an impact and it became a pretty defining moment uh, within advertising. I have run out of time, so I'm gonna really quickly wrap up. Um, look, the context is that today when we're standing in this office, it's really hard for us to imagine, uh, you know, with our sort of smoke-free offices, from Google and our hospitals that are smoke-free, uh, and uh, you know airplanes that are smoke-free. But in the third world, this is still a huge, huge problem. Um, and actually, the Marlboro Man still exists in a big form. Um, and I mean, what I want to really say is that although the government can con continue to play ping pong with uh, companies like this, they've always been one step ahead, and the marketing mix has always evolved. Um, so really, what I'm going to sort of leave you with is. Um, a little bit of food for thought. We, as advertisers, um, are pretty good at some of the stuff we do. We create icons, and we create heroes. Uh, and you've seen all of these before. Um, and, and we can really sort of have a huge impact uh, and influence with our choice of stories that we tell. And therefore, it puts a huge responsibility on us uh, to be able to choose those stories with care. 
uh, and make sure that the impact that we have um, is positive because actually we have the power to make a pretty damn solid impact. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I mean, I actually feel uh, in a slightly unpleasant position making you vote and decide between them. And it's certainly, I came along not knowing what cases people were going to introduce. And it certainly satisfied the Advertising Association's um, aim in showing that advertising works in lots of different complementary ways. There isn't one way it works. It, just to summarise very quickly, just to help you um, uh, think in terms of one to five, David's point was it now, particularly enabled by digital technology, enables millions of people to coordinate very small actions which can add up to something really, really big. And that's now more possible than ever, I think. You know, the little one or two P transactions which multiplied by a few million can really make a difference. And that's, you know, advertising still, in many cases, not all, needs scale. But then the second case is actually almost the opposite of that. This is actually the extraordinary levelling and democratising power of digital advertising, which enables someone in a kitchen table to achieve the same kind of reach and the same kind of communication power and to actually break through, which arguably in the age before digital would have simply been impossible. You know, you would have waited for a large company to come up with that idea and you might have waited quite a long time, to be absolutely honest. Um, third, in Elspeth's case, I think it's a really important point that actually... Um, advertising can actually be part of the show. It can be emphatically no, no, no. It's very, very difficult to actually legislate which is which and to define which is which, but the fact that it can be part of the show is, I think, still hugely important. Joanna's point, which, by the way, we often forget in defending advertising, which is, uh, it pays for the media. <laughs> now, in, there are probably cases where that's a great thing and other cases where it isn't. Uh, it's probably a more important role when we fund newspapers than when we fund, uh, for example, television, by and large, although there's great investigative television. Uh, but it's still a hugely important point, which is that it's important for media to reach large numbers of people. And it's, it's easy to forget that actually a lot of the media we take for granted would be, if you grudge paying your monthly Sky bill, imagine how expensive it would be without advertising. So that point and that argument that actually it funds something centrally and therefore makes democratic uh, a media which would be actually in many cases a kind of luxury good without it uh, is wor really, really worth remembering. And of course you get bonus marks for Dr. Johnson quotes in my book. Um, <laughs> Dr. Johnson actually, uh, um, one of the first people who understood the, the difference between a product and a benefit because he had to auction off the contents of Mrs. Thrale's brewery. And he said, what we are selling here today, gentlemen, is not mere vats and tons, but the potentialities of wealth beyond the dreams of avarice. Uh, I think so he was a pretty good, pretty good copywriter in, uh, you know, in his own right, I think. Um, only fair to say. And then Imad's point, actually, storytelling. And actually linking it to religion. Collective action, you know, for lots of people to actually have shared beliefs and to coordinate behaviour as religion achieves and as advertising can achieve, requires great storytelling. Now, we can debate the long-term efficacy or the benefits of the Marlborough Man, but as an extraordinary case of reframing something. And actually, in, fascinatingly, in creating a brand that's... Um, if you think about it, there was no... That was absolutely a socially neutral cigarette brand. We aspired, strangely, the hero was a working man doing manual labour, and the brand, therefore, had an appeal that translated to practically anybody anywhere, which is a spectacularly miraculous achievement when you look at it in that way. But it also contains within it, of course, the seeds of caution, which is be careful of the stories that you tell. Maybe you just don't know at the time always. But we now have a vote. I've been asked to, to consider just, you know, not, not, not only these three things, but to give thought to originality and bravery of thought, um, presentation style, and also, you know, the business value or social value, I don't necessarily distinguish, of uh, the ideas you've seen shown. And so if you grab, you should have beside you these little, um, uh, uh, these little handheld devices uh, which enable you to vote. 
And what we'll do now is, if you, I think, be careful before you press them, because I'm fairly sure you only get to vote once, and there is no override function uh, on the device. So if you change your mind, I'm afraid uh, it's a bit too late, like the United Nations. Um, however, what we will do then, having taken the vote, we'll see the results, and we'll then hold a, a Q&A with the top two. And on the basis of that Q&A, um, we'll then decide the overall winner. So just a reminder again, number uh, vote one for David Adamson, two for Mary Burris, <laughs> if you like, uh, three for Elspeth Fisher, four for Joanna Geary, and five for Ahmad Nadim. Everybody's clear about the order and the... Does anybody, nobody wants to stand up? Just, oh, go on, we'll do that, just to remind you, just in case you are muddled. <laughs> so if David Adamson briefly stands up, just for a second, then... <laughs> just in case we have people who are generally confused or, 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 or bemused. Uh, Bit Mary, number two. There we are. <laughs> Elspeth, number three. Oh dear, tipped her wine over. Uh, Joanna, number four. <laughs> and Imad, number five. You should, should. Are we technologically ready? Yes? Um, uh, do I get a thumbs up from over there? Yep. In which case, you're ready to vote now. Off we go. Scary. Looks like we have a result, folks. Are we ready to display it? OK, and the results are... Whoa! Whoa. The first and the last. So if you're ready to go up on stage, we'll take a quick Q&A for a couple of minutes. Are you both happy to reappear? You haven't we sunk into drunkenness in we the intervening... We had a, a bit of a strategy where we were going to come third, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, always a good move. No. Um, questions? Must be some. The questions can be either to both. Yes, gentlemen over there. Uh, what made you pick the, uh, the Marlborough Man as your example? Um, <laughs> a lot of conversations that uh, didn't actually say the Marlboro Man, Man should be the best campaign ever. Uh, I was trying to pick something a little bit left field, obviously, as you do for these events. Um, but everyone that I spoke to would sort of channel towards some of the obvious things. Um, I've, uh, I've grown up in sort of Pakistan, um, and cigarettes have affected quite a lot of people around me. Um, and actually, even though that was the case, I'd always sort of seen this advertising and thought, wow, that's cool. Um, and it, it was actually, in the end, a conversation uh, with uh, an uncle back home uh, around, hey, you know what, I'm doing this thing. And he was like, yeah, you know, have you seen the Marlboro ad? Uh, and, and that's kind of what inspired me because, and initially I wasn't really sure and the AA wasn't very sure about whether we want to talk about some of the negative impacts, but actually it's, it's the right thing for us to really know what the power is of what we do, so, yeah. Gentlemen there, yeah. Oh, that's actually from Ad again. Um, you talked, uh, obviously, a lot about the Marlboro Man, and um, Welcome to Flavor Country is obviously a very uh, emotive line rooted in more of a kind of almost a consumer benefit over a product benefit. Now, time and time again as account manager, you try and sell in these ideas and always, almost always comes back to this product benefit. How can advertising change the world if we struggle to, con to persuade a client to be brave? <laughs> <laughs> that is an epic question. Um, I mean, you know, David, you should jump in as well when you can because I'm going to struggle yeah. with this okay, one. Um, nice. But, far, but, like but from, a, from a client point of view, I can tell you um, there are often times when um, we feel that, you know, some of the ideas we've got are almost too bold and, you know, are we brave enough? Uh, equally, I've got to be honest, as a client, there are as many times when uh, agencies will come and pitch to you ideas that are not brave enough and you're almost flipping roles and saying, oh, it's just not edgy enough, it's just not gritty enough. Um, and it ends up being about personal choice and you know, it depends on who that person was that spoke to Leo Burnett in, I'm sure, a liquid uh, lunch environment uh, and uh, came up with sort of, you know, we gotta do something different. Uh, but what I really liked about this particular campaign and the lesson for me was that actually the best campaigns are not the ones that do the rational message. They, you know, there was a very clear rational message out there even until the late 1990s when Marlboro Man was running in even this part of the world, uh, when um, it was all around sort of, you know, <laughs> cigarettes are deadly, they're gonna kill you. Uh, but yet the emotional message was just so strong 
that it, that it completely outweighed what you knew for a fact when you were picking it up. So, so, so really, you know, as long as it's an emotive message, um, you can't, if there isn't a formula to it, so you do have to take a punt on it, and you do need a brave client um, and a ballsy agent, uh, agency person to actually make it happen, so. More. A few more. I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a lady there. I'd like to ask the speakers what their backup ideas were. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's funny because when you're when you're uh, when you're asked to do something like this, it's really easy to kind of think that people are just going to knock out three or four ideas and then whittle it down to the final one. But actually, I found the way that I did this pretty much worked in the way that I explained how I got to the idea that I arrived at. I started thinking at the really, really big things, the really, really massive brand campaigns that have helped craft the world that, that I was born into. But, um, and then I was just like, no, that's a bit naff. Um, that's not really relevant for my age group or for, well, no, it is relevant for my age group, but it's, it's, it's just as important to talk about something that has changed the world as something that has the potential to keep influencing and changing the world. Um, so, I mean, that doesn't really answer your question, but it was more a case of me playing around with the question and landing on something smaller rather than something bigger. You're not going to tell them what your actual backup is? I can't remember what it was. I feel quite on the spot right now. <laughs> oh, actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I did have this idea about maybe doing a talk about the Nazis and how they perfected branding, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, we all know what happened to Russell Brand when he was kicked out of the GQ magazine the other day, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Probably after going for dinner with these guys, I was like, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Although Hugo Boss, excellent tailoring of the outfits there. <laughs> true. But imagine how much different world history would be if he just designed like cashmere <laughs> sweaters and casual <laughs> slacks. I'm just saying, you know. Um, I, mean, I, th I think the advertising in, uh, association is heaving a sigh of relief at the moment because <laughs> journalists going out and saying after a long debate, the advertising industry <laughs> chose its favourite two campaigns and it's one for Marlborough and another <laughs> one for the. <laughs> I think, I think that would have, you know, that, that would have actually posed some issues. I think. Um, I'm, I'm call me old fashioned. I may be wrong. The mystery to me is always the uh, um, uh, Ronald McDonald, because as a child, I found clowns extremely creepy. Both my children find them extremely creepy. And I now discover that as a 47 year old man, I still find them creepy. Uh, so who the particular audience is who love them, God only knows. But there you go. Um, more questions. We must have one more. Oh, sorry, we didn't have your, your backup. Yeah, so I had a slightly more straightforward one. I've just recently gotten engaged, and it was a very expensive ring. Uh, and <laughs> I'm really hoping for that uh, return investment, and so it was, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it was uh, diamonds forever. Uh, so slightly more mainstream than you. <laughs> Perfect. Lady here, yeah. You got, you've got a microphone just approaching. Hi. Um, this is a question for David. Um, so... You were talking about um, lots of little small ideas making a big idea rather than a kind of a big brand campaign. Mm -hmm. So as a planner, in your opinion, mm -hmm. do you see that as being the future? I see that being the future in the sense of facilitating things happen. I mean, I'm not talking about the end of big ideas. I think that's kind of death to a lot of what makes our industry so fantastic and exciting to be part of. What I'm talking about is big ideas with small builds. So thinking really, really big, but thinking about the way that you action it or the way that you get people involved and building it tiny. I think the moment that we start transitioning from big thinking to small thinking, that's when we're losing some really key stuff about what we do. So it's all about big ideas, but building small. Yes. Sorry, Mike's just coming. I was just wondering, because we've got two ends of the spectrum, we've got the sort of the really great advertising that does really good causes stuff, and then we've got the, the sort of the evil aspects of advertising, but equally effective. Um, and, and just thinking about this idea that, um, we, you know, we need to be careful about the stories we tell. Do you think that um, in, in this day and age, um, we do enough as an industry to consider how we tell stories and the stories that we tell? And should we be more aware of the impact we have? Or do, do we actually do quite a good job? <laughs> I think that um, I think the way that we tell stories has become a lot more fragmented. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing, though. People seem to think that stories 
have to have a chronological, I mean, they've got a logical flow, but there's a set beginning, a set middle, a set ending, and I'm sure a lot of that principle still remains. But if you look at the way, say, a lot of younger people digest content at the moment, they're digesting it through kind of a snippet on TV, a snippet on their phone on the go, they'll finish it on the bus home from school, then they'll watch the rest of it on their phone at 11 o'clock at night in between doing their homework. Um, I think what's more important is about thinking about how stories that we create can flex across different mediums rather than worrying its, itself about if we're doing a good enough, of, good enough job of telling the integral parts of the story itself. Because I think stories are quite a, a natural human thing that we're all attracted to anyway. Um, so I think it's kind of, what, what I'm trying to say is the actual art of storytelling isn't being lost at the moment. I'd say just the mechanic and the way that we're telling it is shifting around a lot. I think you're absolutely right. And just building on David's point, it's, um, I think we're a little bit lost. Uh, and. Um, We've traditionally been used to a certain form of storytelling, and that is changing quite considerably because it's not necessarily, very strictly speaking, about us telling our story uh, anymore because, you know, who wants to hear it? Uh, and it's almost sort of how do you create something or enable, and, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the core, but how do you enable a platform which gets people in? to co-create that story with you. People want participation now. It's not about sort of the big ad campaign. You know, once in a while, those will still do really well. Uh, but people want to be involved. Mm. Uh, and um, do you know what? Like most people don't really want to be involved in most brands that they, uh, they buy. They buy them for the value it gives them. Uh, but actually, the really good stories will be those that uh, are co-created with the people that are truly genuinely interested uh, in what you have to say and so transparency for example uh, and bringing people in and opening the doors to them and then seeing what happens is uh, a scary scary notion but that's going to be what i think is going to be the evolution of how we tell stories yeah and i don't sorry just to build on that point even further i mean <laughs> we should just go and have a chat around the corner shouldn't we? <laughs> uh, um i mean at the end of the day people i don't know if i should be saying this an ad association but people don't people don't necessarily need advertising. What they need is free platforms or tools or, or stories or, or products or services or tools. Um, and it's quite interesting when you apply that thought to how we do tell our stories at the moment and how you weave that through so it's useful. Yeah. Gentlemen there, if we can, sorry, if we can, we've got a microphone coming down. Yeah. Um, just wanted to ask you, did you consult each other before choosing your trousers this morning? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Bad>. High five. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Martin Weigel, whose blog I read quite regularly, um, writes quite extensively on um, almost rubbishing the, um, the, the sort of differentiation within Marketplace, and he argues that um, as brands, we need to focus on becoming interesting um, rather than different on the basis that people are actually quite passive consumers of brands. People don't really care that much about most brands. Um, and I just wanted, you know, from a client and an agency point of view, what your, whether you agree with that or what your thoughts on that are. I th think that, sorry, before I lose this thought, um, I think, yeah, you talk about being interesting rather than different. You can keep applying that model, but all we're going to end up with is a lot more interesting stuff out there. I mean, for example, the internet is a classic example of that. We now have at our fingertips an endless array of really interesting stuff. Too much, in fact. So actually, I think being differentiating is going to be something that remains essential in what we do. I think, I mean, it's one of those sort of really academic arguments, isn't it? Because you could just say, that by being different, you are interesting, or by being interesting, you're already different, mm -hmm. because not everyone is interesting. And if everyone was interesting, then no one would be interested, interesting. Uh, and so it's, it's, it is fairly relative. And so I, I honestly don't think it's about one or the other. Uh, we have loads of examples of uh, brands which work in a fairly homogenous environment. And really, the product that you consume it isn't very much different from anything else. Uh, and you know the story that they're telling you know, is interesting. And so you, know, you could argue it both ways. Uh, but, I mean, I think it is a very uh, sort of academic argument and does depend on the brand and the industry you're in. So, for example, for us in the FMCG sector, I work on Kenko, which is an instant coffee. Um, and, you know, most instant coffees have a very small uh, sort of range of differentiation between them. Um, and uh, the only thing that can differentiate them is the stories you tell. 
And so if there's a, something that is inherently different about the product, then it could play a bigger role uh, within sort of, you know, the environment of being not that interesting, but otherwise you have to be, so. A bit confused, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Lady there, um, and then I'll, I'll one more question, if anybody wants to blag the last question. Nobody? No, lady there. So, okay, well, two, uh, two more to go. It's that, a question for Emad. Is that, is yes, that right? Is. Good. Um, so the Marlboro guy is a fantastic case study for the effectiveness of advertising. Um, and, of course, the morally dubious nature of it kind of asks us to sort of consider whether or not we should be more selective in what we choose to work on or whether we should choose to be less effective what we work on but I guess neither of those things being a client you would want us agency folk in the room to do so I just wanted to understand what lesson you want us to take out of your your talk yeah so the lesson for me from that was I actually really admire the Marlboro man I think it's something that we uh, you know I mean, if you remove the ethical uh, part of the product and the effect that it's had uh, and some of the ways in which recruitment happened and so on, um, actually, I think as an entity of itself, we should be proud of what one of the things you know, that we've created that has actually fundamentally had such a widespread impact that it's you know, across the world, uh, governments and regulators have gone like, oh my god, advertising is actually something we need to think about. So it's brought us onto the map in a really big way. Um, and therefore, I think we shouldn't necessarily shy away from the fact that we've created it, uh, largely speaking, uh, and uh, the fact that it has been extremely effective. Um, when you're thinking about sort of you know agency clients and really how we select these, I don't. I think it's really easy for us, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, to critique it or to say it was really brilliant. Um, and often it is a punt, and you don't really know what you're going to get into. What I would say is that it it comes down to sort of our own value system. And uh, there was a clip while I was researching this that I was looking at where the guy that uh, headed up Marlboro at that time uh, was talking about the effect of cigarettes on um, pregnant women. Uh, and he said, according to um, you know, the, what research that we found medically proven, uh, women that are pregnant and smoke have smaller babies. He's like, I know plenty of women that would love to have smaller babies. Um, and I think you know, that really, for me, hit the nail on the head of there was something inherently in the value system of the people that were heading up the organization that enabled work like this to go in a certain direction. Um, and I suppose the lesson for us is that we have the opportunity to choose that value system today and define what direction each of our brands go in as well. Uh, and you know, I could take, you know, for example, going back to Kenko, uh, into you know, the, the, sort of in one direction as something that is all around sort of glamour and you know, whatever else. Uh, but on the other side, I could do something around sort of it being more ethical and so on. So you know, th that choice does actually lie with, with us. Um, and we'll never choose work that is ineffective, obviously. Uh, but we don't know. Uh, and so the best judgment that we can make is based on our own value system. So I think it's really, really important uh, to cut a long story short that our brands, no matter how big they are and how long they've been for, um, if we're managing them today, that they mirror some of our own personal values, and that's the responsibility we all need to take. Last, do, do you want to add anything? Or um, you're, you're happy? In which case, last question. Hello. <laughs> Lady there, perfect, all two. Um, just to be fair, can I have a last question to both of them? <laughs> yes, <laughs> very fair. Um, to Imad, um, do you think there is a modern day uh, Marlboro man? And um, to David, um, you say you don't think we need advertising, we just need a free platform to share ideas and, um, mm. and content. Do you think that's possible without advertising? Mm, sorry, can I jump in there? No, mm. that's not, that's <laughs> very clever spin on what I was saying, damn you. <laughs> just giving you the chance to answer. <laughs> uh, I think what I'm saying is perhaps, um, okay, I'll tell you what. The number of people who've said to me today, they've talked about a story or said, oh God, of course that happened before you were born though which they then think is being complimentary to me, but then makes us actually feel a bit awkward. Like it's, oh my God, Rory Sutherland said something that we didn't know because we were <laughs> born there. Um, what I'm actually talking about is a way that advertising has evolved for, a, or the way that advertising has the potential to evolve for a slightly more, mo for a slightly younger age group or the way that that is gonna be crafted for us. Sorry, I'm not articulating that very well, but I'm saying that it's not the end of advertising. I think it's an evolution of the way that advertising is gonna develop forward. Um, is there a modern equivalent of a Marlboro man? Um, frankly, I don't think there is. Uh, there are people that come close and have 
are almost sort of the images of the brands that they reflect. And you know, being in this building, you can't ignore uh, you know the entire sort of geek squad. Uh, and uh, you know these tech billionaires uh, and people like Elon Musk, uh, who used to look after uh, PayPal and is now shooting rockets into space and looks after Tesla as well. Um, so there are, I don't think there are genuinely sort of campaigns at the moment. Uh, and, and we struggled with this on the whole, um, but actually finding something modern day, it's just, I, I, th I think the model has changed. So to an earlier question, uh, you, I don't think a modern uh, day sort of story that was kind of like the uh, Marlboro Man could work. Um, and therefore, I don't think there are any equities out there that are that in that direction. Thank you very much. So we have a final vote. If you can reach for your, thank you. That's absolutely fantastic. If you can reach your devices for the penultimate time, there's one more, uh, one more little thing we're going to ask you to vote on just at the very end. Um, I have here, all the speakers actually will have something, but I have a little first reward for the winner, just to, just to build up the expectation a little. And just to be clear, Emmett's number one, David's number two. Are you ready to vote? Now. Reveal the winner now. Whoa! Come on up. Congratulations, that's absolutely fantastic. I'm very, very brave Thank as well. You. Absolutely tremendous. Thank you very much. Very, um, yeah, don't smoke cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I want to say, just in case you go away suffused with self-loathing at having voted uh, uh, a tobacco campaign, you know, one of the greatest and most significant world-changing uh, contributions of advertising, it is worth remembering in the 50s, when it, where it owes its origins, the majority of males, adult males, smoked. Okay? So this was not seen as sort of a deviant behavior. It was actually a social norm. And the question was really, what brand? It wasn't, you know, you, you know, uh, non-smokers were actually a slightly weird, irritating minority back then. I suppose you could also make the case, which is interesting, which is still possibly interesting, that actually at least the story, that of the smoker as r rugged libertarian individualist, has an element of truth to it, perhaps. So there is something truthful about it, but it is worth remembering back in the 1950s where that had its origins. It's almost impossible for us to, I, I can, di well, see, there we go, I'm being old again, but I can dimly remember where it was just assumed that you could smoke in people's houses without asking them. I can just about remember, you know, when my father would just go into people's homes and light up in the front room. And if they ever raised an objection, which nobody did, but one, one person did, they were viewed as basically being a deranged crank. So it is worth, it is worth you know, placing every campaign and every bit of work within its time and within the culture of its time. And um, so before you go away sort of, you know, feeling guilty about this verdict, I think it's actually a very brave verdict. And I also think it's good to see that the industry actually still rewards bravery because that was a spectacularly brave choice. And so we're very, very pleased for that. So we hope what you've heard today from all five speakers just reminds you of the fact that advertising works and has wider effects in many, many ways. There are lots and lots of external benefits and, let's be candid, certainly in the case of the Nazis, some external costs. Um, but the fact that actually it has wider effects and makes wider contributions to the working of business, the working of competitive markets, but also to the solution of government and social problems, um, is absolutely worth bearing in mind. One of the things that makes me most optimistic about working in this business now is that little things, it's small, it's not very fast, but the interest in behavioral economics, the government's uh, instigation of a behavioral insight team uh, within the cabinet office, um, the fact that I find at Ogilvy Change, you get clients calling you actually, to come and speak about this stuff. What is really, really healthy is that for the first time, arguably, since the 1950s when Marlboro Man originated, businesses and governments are starting to recognize that actually psychology can solve things. Not every bit of human behavior change takes place because of economic incentives, taxation, or some form of economic bribery. That actually the better use of psychological insight is a major source of either competitive advantage or social benefit, or both. So that fact is the fact that the Advertising Association really wants you to go away and trumpet. That actually 
you know, there was, I think, a period particularly true um, maybe 10 years ago where, um, you know, before the advent of really important people, books like Nudge, uh, people like, for example, Daniel Kahneman and so forth, where effectively economics owned the domain of the social sciences and all policy making and all business decisions were effectively seen through the lens of economics and psychology, just the idea that actually coming up with solutions that fit our innate mental makeup is a good thing to do and is more profitable, uh, more effective, creates better behavioral change than simply designing things around some sort of weird economic model. The very fact that that's now rising in prominence, and in part we have the recession to thank for that actually, a terrible thing to say, I'm sorry to say this, but actually provided you keep your job, which is a big if, it's nicer working in advertising in and after a recession because there's actually an appetite for imagination and change. Whereas in boom times, broadly speaking, the default mode is do what I did last time, but a bit more of it, costing a bit less. There is actually, you know, the mother of invention, as we call it, there is actually a mood when you have, uh, you, know, so, you know, more challenging economic times that people are actually looking for genuinely inventive solutions to things, not just doing something they've done before at a larger scale and a slightly lower cost. So we can be hopeful about that. But I mean, as I said, the Advertising Association um, is absolutely clear about if we can have a wider debate about uh, the benefits that these psychological and communication solutions can bring, uh, we'll all be better off for it, both selfishly ourselves in our jobs, but I also think in the kind of solutions that governments, companies and markets actually look for. I genuinely believe that actually that, you know, the next revolution here isn't going to be more technology, it's going to be better psychology. You know, and, and, and as I think we see now, we're only at the beginnings of beginning to grasp uh, how these things work. So massive congratulations to Ahmed, congratulations too to David uh, for being a very spirited opponent and to all five speakers for providing very convincingly five very different reasons in which what we do can actually change and mostly uh, improve the world. So uh, finally that, one more thing, thanks to Google immensely for hosting this, um, a tremendous facility. Thank you all for coming, up on such, coming out on such a dismal evening to support the cause. Thanks. <laughs>